Hey everyone, Misco Electric here. Today is Sunday, June 30th, 2024, and this is The Current, weekly EV news. Our goal is to provide the most helpful 10 minutes of EV and electrification stories available anywhere. We frequently hear about EV recalls in the news, and usually the automaker is Tesla. Generally, Tesla's recalls are software only, and the solutions are implemented over the air without requiring the driver to take any action. This week, there are some physical recalls to mention. Tesla recalled nearly 11,000 Cybertrucks to improve adhesion on a plastic fascia near the truck bed and to replace wiper motors which could fail due to excessive current. Owners have responded in the forums saying these recalls were completed while they waited in less than an hour. Some outlets have presented the recalls as unprecedented for pickup trucks, but last year Ford recalled 200,000 traditional gasoline-powered F-150 pickup trucks for a wiper motor problem. This week, they recalled over 500,000 F-150s for a transmission problem. This week, Porsche also recalled over 30,000 Taycan sports cars in the U.S. over a potential brake fluid leak which can cause failure of the front brakes. It is not a problem related to EV-specific componentry. Of course, that is important for a nearly 5,000-pound sports car considering about 70% of the braking bias is up front. The fix should be quick and relatively inexpensive for Porsche involving the replacement of front hoses. After filing Chapter 11 bankruptcy, Fisker is recalling all of the Ocean SUVs they have produced since May when Magna paused production. Fisker says on certain vehicles the exterior door handles may stick, preventing customers from entering or exiting a particular door. Following thorough investigations, Fisker Engineering has identified this as a potential safety concern during critical scenarios in which a door is inoperable. This means Fisker is stuck with the inventory of vehicles they are under pressure to convert to dollars to repay creditors during the bankruptcy proceedings until the recall work is complete. It seems as if EV recalls make headlines and the general public might have more awareness of the recall than any other details of the product. In many cases, the severity of recalls is not well understood. We hope the story will be helpful in offering clarity when the subject comes up. The biggest EV story of the week is probably the announcement of a joint venture between Rivian and Volkswagen Group. While the terms of the deal have not been completely finalized, Volkswagen has already transferred an initial $1 billion to Rivian as an unsecured convertible note. An additional $4 billion could flow in the same direction through 2026. If the companies are able to hash out the details, VW will pay Rivian another $1 billion later this year for intellectual property and equity. Various milestones over the next two years can keep the capital infusion coming. These funds are expected to provide Rivian with the resources needed to complete the factory in Georgia and fully ramp up the production of the mass market R2. Their joint venture will focus on the development of software-defined vehicle architectures, utilizing Rivian's zonal architecture design and platform as the foundation for future EVs. Last week, the Rivian team showed me the zonal architectural hardware they've developed and outlined how it drastically reduces costs associated with production and service. This technology should be able to save billions of dollars for Volkswagen Group and its many sub-brands. Rivian said they will be designating a chief technology officer in the joint venture, while Volkswagen in turn will contribute its expertise in vehicle engineering and manufacturing, as well as its extensive global reach. Volkswagen Group is the second largest automobile manufacturer in the world, behind Toyota. The scale will allow Rivian to further reduce the costs of these systems and realize further revenue licensing with other automakers. Over the past year, Rivian and Volkswagen have been meeting and testing a fleet of camouflaged Audis with Rivian's zonal architecture underpinnings. During Rivian's Investor Day presentation this week, CEO and founder of Rivian, RJ Scaringe, stressed that this partnership does not currently extend to the dashboard display user interfaces. Volkswagen Group CEO Oliver Bloom said VW will continue to develop software under their Carrier division as well as their existing partnership with Chinese automaker Xpeng. What hasn't been established yet is how each company will share revenue under this joint venture and whether or not Rivian will continue to make money in the long term on this deal. 
Rivian stressed that the agreement is not definitive and there are still several details to be established, but they expect to finalize the deal in Q4 of this year. It's important to note that this is not the first time Rivian has attempted partnerships with other automakers. Ford made an initial investment of $500 million in 2019. Ford said it would use Rivian's electric platform to develop its own Lincoln-branded EV, but by 2020, those plans were canceled and each company decided to focus on their own developments for future EVs separately. Ford had sold all but 1.15% of their shares of Rivian stock by 2022. In 2022, Rivian and Mercedes-Benz announced a partnership to create a joint venture for their van division in hopes to streamline production of each of their electric vans in Europe. Three months later, it was canceled. Mercedes-Benz cited an ongoing reprioritization at Rivian as the cause of the interruption. Rivian said they wanted to focus on their consumer and existing commercial business to maximize value for Rivian. This is also not Volkswagen Group's first investment in an electric vehicle startup. Since 2018, Volkswagen's Porsche brand has held 22% ownership of Croatian EV, technology, and energy storage producer Remats Group. Porsche also owns 45% of the Bugatti Remats division. The first Volkswagen Group vehicle to hit the market with Rivian co-developed technologies is scheduled to launch in the second half of the decade. We don't know which VW brand will get the vehicle first. Both companies have stated that VW's new Scout brand could benefit from this architecture. RJ acknowledged that Scout is likely to compete directly with Rivian for outdoor enthusiast buyers. He reiterated that 76% of Rivian's customers are first-time EV buyers and that much more product variety in the marketplace will be required for realization of his vision of 100% EV adoption. What are your thoughts on this new strategic partnership between Volkswagen and Rivian? Who will benefit more? We briefly talked about Remats and their relationship with Volkswagen, but Remats had some of its own news to share this week. CEO Mate Remats and former Chief Strategy Officer at Remats, Marco Pezhkovic, have taken the cover off their stealth electric robotaxi project, formerly known as Project 3 Mobility. Introducing Vern. Vern is an urban autonomous mobility service with a ride-hailing platform providing two-seater robo-taxis for city communities. The new company is largely backed by a division of the Saudi Public Wealth Fund, Kia, and the European Commission, amongst other investors. Vern's two-seater robo-taxi EV will be powered by Mobileye's advanced autonomous driving platform called Mobileye Drive, which utilizes cameras, radar, and six LiDAR sensors. The platform is designed to be highly flexible and scalable to meet the demands of autonomous driving in a variety of locations on different road types under varying weather conditions and even taking local driving styles into account within its operational design domains. It will have a 60 kilowatt hour battery pack and a front mounted permanent magnet motor with an expected duration per charge of 14 to 17 hours in urban use and to recharge in 30 minutes. Vern has no steering wheel or pedals. Riders will experience a 17-speaker sound system and 43-inch ultra-wide display. They call the interior a room on wheels, complete with electrochromic glass, a sunroof named the halo ring, and incredible legroom. The center console contains a physical switch which can be used as a start-stop for the ride called the median. The console screen and the app will offer riders the ability to make adjustments for preconditioning, music, scent, and lighting. The vehicles will be geofenced in urban areas and will be authorized for use at speed limits up to 80 miles per hour in urban expressways. The vehicle will not have windshield wipers or side view mirrors for better aerodynamic performance and for easier cleaning. In every city Vern deploys in, there will be at least one facility called the Mothership, where teams can inspect, maintain, clean, and charge the vehicles daily with up to 100 kilowatts of charging speeds. Remats plans to launch Vern in Zagreb, Croatia in 2026 and intends to expand into other European cities and the Middle East afterwards. The company claims to have signed agreements with 11 cities and is in talks with over 30 more worldwide. Former director of design at Remats and current design chief at Vern, Adriano Mudri, said, why a two-seater? 
because the data shows that 9 out of 10 rides are used by one or two people. Therefore, we can satisfy most of all trips with a two-seater and create unmatched interior space in a compact size vehicle. We completely redefined interior space. More space than a Rolls Royce to relax and spend your time well. We optimized the door opening so people can just step in and sit down straight away. Sliding doors were designed not to obstruct traffic flow around the vehicle while still arriving in style. Once inside, passengers can stretch out their legs and get super comfortable. We wanted to make the interior less automotive and more like a living room. Tesla is set to unveil their final robotaxi design on August 8th. Sketches published in the Walter Isaacson biography reveal a similar design. Earlier this week, Google's Waymo opened its service to the general public. I've personally experienced both Cruise and Waymo autonomous taxi services in San Francisco. I think it's an exciting development to reduce vehicle congestion in cities. While there is plenty of opportunity to refine the experience, Waymo in particular exceeded my expectations. What are your feelings about trying out a robo-taxi? Last week, we published our episode of The Current hours before the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb began. Here's an update on the EVs which competed in this year's Race to the Clouds. Spain's rally champ Danny Sordo clocked the fastest time in the exhibition division, setting the benchmark electric modified SUV slash crossover record in the Hyundai Ioniq 5 N TA spec with a time of 9 minutes and 30.852 seconds. Hyundai established a second electric vehicle record for an electric production SUV slash crossover of 10 minutes, 49.267 seconds with veteran Hoonigan Ron Zaris behind the wheel. Pike's Peak veteran Randy Popst rounded out the trio of Hyundai drivers who brought an impressive effort to Pike's Peak with his time of 9 minutes, 55.551 seconds, considering he had limited time with testing and was called to participate just five days prior to the race. Rivian's senior performance testing engineer Gardner Nichols captured the electric production truck record he set in his personal R1T in 2023 by driving the new quad motor R1T in just 10 minutes, 53.883 seconds, which was 30 seconds better than last year's run. To top it off, the king of the mountain for the 2024 Pikes Peak International Hill Climb was claimed by Roman Dumas and the Ford Performance team in the F-150 Lightning Super Truck with a time of 8 minutes, 55.553 seconds. What's wild about this is that the vehicle unexpectedly shut off during the first sector of the race, which Dumas said cost him 26 seconds. He remarked that he was glad that he studied up the night before on what to do in case of a shutdown, and it sure came in handy in the moment. All that considered, Roman still holds the title for the all-time record at Pikes Peak and picked up his fifth King of the Mountain for the year, beating the closest 2024 competitor by 11 seconds. It is fantastic to see EVs continue to set records and dominate in historic racing events across the world. What EV would you like to see compete in the Pikes Peak Hill Climb? There was quite a bit of news for Geely and their sub-brands this week. Starting off, Volvo has announced they have delayed deliveries of their compact electric utility, the EX30, for the U.S. market until 2025. Volvo is in the process of adding production of the EX30 in Belgium, which could help its compliance with recent increase of tariffs on Chinese-produced EVs. Polestar has begun deliveries of the Polestar 3 in the U.S. market. The model is currently made in Chengdu, China, and will be produced in South Carolina alongside its sister vehicle, Volvo's EX90, later this year. The company also announced a new long-range single-motor variant option, which will be offered to U.S. customers later this year. Geely has debuted a new generation lithium iron phosphate battery with greater energy density and fast charging capabilities. Their new Aegis short blade battery is said to deliver best-in-class battery life, charging speed, and safety. Its shorter form factor should allow the battery pack to have a lower profile, which will make svelte new vehicle silhouettes possible. Geely says the Aegis will have a 192 watt-hour per kilogram energy density. The average density of a lithium iron phosphate cell is around 150 watt hours per kilogram, and the average energy density of a premium lithium ion battery cell is generally more than 220 watt hours per kilogram. 
Geely is touting 3,500 cycles over the short blade's lifetime with minimal degradation or impact on range. That means it could be used to travel over 600,000 miles or 12,400 miles per year for up to 50 years. Citing their testing data, they also said the average fast charging time for the Aegis short blade battery is 17 minutes and 4 seconds. It also has strong low temperature performance with the battery capacity still above 90% at minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. The Aegis short knife battery safety properties are unique as well. Geely said it has passed the six devil serial tests of the China Automobile Center, including seawater surfing, extreme cold on the plateau, high frequency bottom scraping, extreme crushing, side pillar collision of the battery pack, and blazing flames. Geely said they have applied their self-developed self-fusing technology on the electrode surfaces to block short circuits in an event of accidents. If the battery cell is punctured during extreme shock, an aluminum foil layer will fuse into the battery diaphragm to create an insulating layer, preventing short circuits and thermal runaway events. They tested it with eight steel nails simultaneously puncturing the battery and left them one hour with zero ill effects. The Aegis battery will first be used in the Geely Galaxy E5 all-electric SUV in early August of this year. Advancements like this, which will allow for new form factors, lower price points, longer range, improved safety, and better longevity move us closer to a world in which every driver chooses to go electric. Well, that's all for this week's edition of The Current. If you haven't yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you considered subscribing and sharing this video if you found some value in this coverage. We will continue making this series as we see growing viewership. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, drive, fly, ride, go electric.